Hello, everyone, and welcome to Next Gen Service. We are so glad that you are here today, and we pray that you'll be blessed wherever you are. If you're new here, you are our special guest. Do click the connect button in the chat, and we would love to say a big hi and connect with you. How's your phase two going so far? You know, this week I've been reflecting a lot about how God is the King of all men, and how that's so similar to how durian is the king of all fruits. It may look hard on the outside, but it is soft and tender on the inside. It brings joy and happiness to anyone who has it in their lives. And it's something good that you always want to share with your friends and family, right? Uh, okay, so while you may now head out to enjoy durians, bubble tea, and high dinner with your friends and family, do continue to stay at home for our worship services. Although religious organizations are allowed to resume worship services for up to 50 people at one time, this will not be feasible for Grace Assembly. As such, we will continue to suspend our on-site services and activities until further notice. We are taking a cautious approach and hence we will encourage all Gracians to continue meeting online for the time being. We are monitoring the situation and reviewing the guidelines closely and we'll keep everyone informed if there are further updates. Now, we encourage you to put aside other distractions like your mobile phones and quieten your hearts as we enter into God's presence for a time of worship. Church, I hope everyone is doing well. Before we go into song worship, I would like to read to you from Psalms 3, verses 3 to 4. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my hand high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. Even though things are starting to look up for us, let us not forget the God who saw us through, and the God who will continue to see us through. Let's come before the Lord, just like how Abraham Isaac and Jacob did, let us rely on him for he is faithful. He is our shield, which is our protector. He lifts our head high. He is our confidence. So let's sing this over ourselves. Let the Lord reign over all.
thank you, Natalie, for an amazing time of worship. Next up, we will be flashing the QR codes on the screen and we encourage you to scan them using your mobile banking app to give an offering to the church. Let us pray. Dear Lord, just want to thank you for this time, for smoothly transitioning all of us into phase two. We pray that as we continue to go about our daily activities, we will also remember to open our hearts and that we will continue to give to you during this time of need, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. Mm -hmm. last weekend when our next gen pastor shared about their father on Father's Day weekend. You can now catch that episode again on our YouTube link or listen on the go wherever you are by subscribing to Next Gen Podcast. This week, we are back with the last two parts of our sermon series, Tia, Tracing the Faithfulness of God Through the Generation. And we have our very own Pastor Joe Yesha who will be bringing us a message. Let's get our hearts ready and focus in to receive Thank you for joining us this afternoon. You could be anywhere with anyone doing anything, but you chose to be with us today. I pray that you will meet God in this service. Well, it's been eight days since phase two began. Most of you should have met up with familiar faces, your grandparents, cousins, church mates, colleagues, and your classmates. I'm especially delighted for the couples in Nexus. The reunion must have been so sweet after many months of long-distance relationship. Well, I went on the first real date with my wife in a real restaurant. It was nice to eat our steaks served on real crockery using real utensils. My kids and I also resumed our usual Monday activities, and this time we went to Skate Scoot at Labrador Park. It was also great to return to the gym and to go for runs again with my exercise buddy. Things we took for granted. You know, you never truly understand the importance of some people or certain experiences until they are taken away from you, albeit temporarily. Some of us have taken for granted our families, our jobs, income, or maybe our lectures and classrooms, or even our services and cell groups. And in these months, I've also witnessed the loss of health and life, where disease and death have knocked on our doors and brought us to our knees. Not too long ago, some of you might recall how my mother-in-law found out she had leukemia in August 2018. And in the same month, both she and my father-in-law found Jesus. We praise God that her cancer went into remission by January 2019, and after her transplant in March 2019, she was on her road to recovery. It was almost as if that God allowed that health scare to turn all of us to God. My family and I have been interceding for my mother-in-law, and I remember that even Hui's non-Christian brother and grandmother were asking us to pray to our God for my mother-in-law. Severe crisis has a way of turning us to God because in that crisis, we realize how limited, helpless, and inadequate we really are. Today, we arrive at a penultimate sermon of the Jia Sermon series and the turning point of Jacob's life. This narrative has been divided into three segments, and each segment will show you how Jacob relied on God alone when he got desperate, and how we can do likewise. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 32. The title of my sermon is Desperation. My big idea is, God is faithful to protect and bless us as we rely on Him alone. So let's learn from the life of Jacob on how to rely on God in desperate times. Firstly, Let's learn to seek God first as plan A. And I'm taking this particular point from Genesis chapter 32, verse 1 to 12. Now, here's the context of the story. Jacob now had four wives, 11 children, a traveling farm, and lots of possessions. God had instructed him to return to Canaan in obedience. This meant that he had to return to face Esau, whom he cheated big time 20 years ago. This particular narrative has so many wordplays, so it would be really fun to unpack it. 
The author used Hebrew puns to help their listeners remember the story better, as well as to pick out significant moments. Now, if you've read the story, you'll see that these verses are about Jacob's plan A, plan B, and plan C in meeting the man he feared would kill him, his elder twin Esau. You can't blame Esau for wanting to do that too, because Jacob had deceived Esau at his birth, claimed Esau's birthright with a meal, and receives Isaac, his father's blessing, meant for Esau. Imagine now you need to meet this guy you've tricked, you've trolled, and you've wronged your entire life. So let's check out Jacob's plan A. He sent messengers ahead to Esau to test waters. Where did he get this idea from? Now you see in chapter 32 verse 1, Jacob met with angels of God or Malachim in Hebrew. Inspired by God in 32 verse 3, Jacob sent messengers or the same word Malachim in Hebrew to Esau. But his men returned with a reply. Your brother is already on his way to meet you with an army of 400 men. <laughs> Plan A scared the living daylights out of Jacob. So Jacob moved to plan B as a response to Esau's reply. He assumed he would be incurring losses, so he divided his household to potentially half the damage. Where did he get this idea from? In chapter 32 verse 2, he named the place Mahanaim, which literally means two camps in Hebrew. Two camps because there were two camps. God's camp of angels and his own camp of people and animals. So in chapter 32, verse 7, he divided his household into two groups of makanoth in Hebrew, which is a word related to mahanaim. Both plans were divinely inspired, don't you think? Activating plan B meant that half of everything and everyone he had would be lost. So Jacob quickly moved to plan C, which is to pray to God and ask God to help him. It really should have been Jacob's plan A, think about it, but I think we can all relate to that. Prayer seems to be our last resort than our first option. Don't we instinctively attempt to solve our own problems instead of asking God to be our problem solver? Nonetheless, Jacob's plan C gave us a glimpse into his prayer template. Firstly, Jacob reminded God of his three-generational relationship with him. O God of my grandfather Abraham and God of my father Isaac. Smart. Then he based his appeal on God's will. O Lord, you told me. Clever. Then Jacob reminded God of two things. Firstly, that he was merely following God's original instructions of return to your own land and to your relatives. Shrewd. Secondly, that he was banking on God's promise to him. And you promised me, I will treat you kindly. Brilliant. Next, and this is crucial, Jacob's posture of prayer is the right one. He humbly acknowledged his limitations. He said, I am not worthy of all the unfailing love and faithfulness you have shown to me. Very exemplary. And finally, he begged God to deliver him on account of God's promises to Abraham. He said, O Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother. You promised me, I will surely treat you kindly and I will multiply your descendants until they become numerous as the sands along the seashore, too many to count. He was in effect quoting what God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. Come, let's clap for Jacob. What a great prayer. But don't miss the bottom line of Jacob's prayer. Plans A and B sucked. It is now go big or go home on plan C. Jacob was telling God, this is all on you now, Lord. Jacob essentially held God to his word to save him from Esau. When ironically, Jacob the deceiver couldn't keep his word to Esau his whole life. Maybe like Jacob, God had been guiding you all this while, dropping you hints here and there to turn to him for help. Perhaps these hints aren't signs of how ingenious or self-sufficient you are, but a sign to get you to look to him. The challenge for most of us is to turn to God as our plan A, instead of waiting until we have no more turns left 
before we seek God for help. And perhaps, like Jacob, the way God works in your life isn't to remove your problems or to vanish your enemies, but to make you move in a way to make you see that plan C is to seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and He will give you everything you need. That's exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 33. In desperate times, why do you rely on yourselves or others or circumstances that got you desperate in the first place. Instead, seek God first as your plan A. Live righteously and God will give you everything you need. God is indeed faithful to protect and bless you as you rely on Him alone. So that's the first point for you. Seek God's plan as plan A. Secondly, let's learn to face up to our greatest And I'm taking this point from chapter 32, verse 13 to 23. Now, just when you think that Jacob had a breakthrough with God in his wonderful prayer, and that he would start relying on God instead of relying on himself to solve his moral dilemma with Esau, he reverted to doing what he did best, rely on himself. I'm sure some of us can relate to Jacob's muscle memory of self-sufficiency. We meet God on a weekend and then we leave Him out on weekdays. We get a breakthrough on Saturday and then we break away on Monday. So let's see what Jacob did. It's not really a bad plan if you examine it closely. He devised a plan to present numerous gifts to Esau. These gifts came in the form of animals. There were a total of 550 animals. To give you some perspective, Jacob gave Esau 22% of the Singapore Zoo. And he did it so systematically, I can almost imagine Esau's reaction each time he received a batch. He would say, any more? Pause for effect. Maybe you'll laugh tomorrow. Okay, now don't miss this irony. In chapter 32, verse 20b to 21a, five times, some form of the Hebrew word for face, which is pane, was used. In English, it reads, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me, and afterward I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him. Now to help you see the irony, I will substitute every English word for pane whenever it is used. I may appease pane with the present that goes ahead of pane, and afterward I shall see his pane. Perhaps he will accept Pane, so the present passed on ahead of Pane. In effect, the author was trying to tell us that Jacob would face up to everything except Esau. That's Pane. And after all the intricate selection of gifts and specific instructions to his servants, even getting them to tell Esau in chapter 32, verse 18, that his servant Jacob was coming right behind them, and again in 20a, that he was right behind them two times. What did Jacob actually do in chapter 32, verse 21b? The Word of God says, Jacob himself spent that night in the camp. So much for saying so much and doing nothing about it. You know, I've learned that it is better to measure someone for what they would do instead of what they say they would do. My son Judah's hair is really long now. He has been refusing to cut it since March. Each time we mention it or take a pair of scissors towards him, he will give an over-the-top reaction, very angry, very, you know, very playful. And we find that super endearing, so we keep doing it to irritate him. And I've been telling him that I'm going to cut his hair when he's taking a nap. And I keep saying it, but I've never done it. So one afternoon before he took a nap, I said it again. Judah, I'm going to cut your hair when you take a nap, just to irritate him. By this time, Eden got so annoyed at my no action talk only. And so she mocked me. And I remember what she said. She said, Papa, you keep saying you want to cut Judah's hair when he's napping, but you haven't done it at all. Stop saying that. Immediately. I came to my senses and realized, yeah, I don't want my daughter to think that I'm not a man of my word. So the very next day, I managed to persuade Judah to let me cut his hair that afternoon. And I did it. 
I didn't want to say things for the sake of saying it anymore. Now, the final thing that Jacob did was to bring his family across the river. This was a dangerous river crossing operation done in the middle of the night under pitch black conditions. And from the way the passage is written, it seems as though he had to return to the camp to oversee the sending over of his possessions. Now, we don't know why he did that, but we know the situation he found himself in. He was alone. This is the ultimate setting of facing up to your own fears when you are alone. I can imagine the fears running through his mind. With every episode of desperation we face, there will be a moment where we will be all alone. In fact, doesn't this happen every night, right before you fall asleep? This is the point where we are weaned off our parents' support, weaned off favourable circumstances, weaned off a busy schedule, an exciting game, an addictive drama, conversations with loved ones, weaned off multiple taps and apps on our mobile phone. And maybe we are forced to face our greatest fears in the still of night. And some will call the still of night the dark night of the soul. For some, the dark night of the soul could be the loneliness that some of us feel as if we are in a meaningless universe where we are struggling to go through the motion We have no sense of direction and maybe it feels like we have lost all hope. For some, our dark nights could be a significant and meaningful part of our personal development because we transit into a deeper perception of life and our place in it. For others, this dark night could be accompanied by a painful shedding of our previous identities, relationships, career, habits or belief system that have given us some form of meaning. And maybe you know someone who in these dark nights plunged into depression where medication could only do so much for them. It is an extremely difficult place to be in and we are never more desperate for God when we are faced with such dark nights. It is in these dark nights where we face our greatest fears on our own and we need God more than ever. May we always remember that God is faithful to protect and bless those who rely on Him alone to get through these dark nights. Was Jacob ready to face Esau on his own? Was he ready to face his fears alone? This leads us to the final part of the narrative. So, my third point for us today, let's learn to let God rename our destinies. And I'm taking that from Genesis chapter 32, 24 to 32. Being consistent with the previous passages, the author uses wordplay again to help readers remember this significant moment. Jacob or Yaakob in Hebrew wrestled or Yaabek in Hebrew at Jabok or Yabok in Hebrew. You can see the wordplay there. And as I've mentioned, Jacob finished his river crossing operation and was now alone in the camp, probably physically wiped out. Then a man came to wrestle with him. Jacob had no idea who this man was, so he wrestled back. It could have been Esau, it could have been one of his servants, it could have been a robber, or even a total stranger. Chapter 32 verse 1 and verse 24 are similar in that someone came to meet Jacob. Maybe Jacob suspected that this man was an angel since Jacob was already in Mahanaim, where angels of God camped. But we must remember that it was in total darkness that Jacob was fighting this man. He had no idea who he was. Hence, he fought with all his might, just like how he had been striving his whole life. Jacob must have been a very strong man to put up a fight with an angel. It was only toward dawn where first light came that Jacob caught a glimpse of the man and realized that this man was an angel. So he changed his stance to ask God for blessing instead. From fighting for his life, he was now clinging on to God. The angel, realizing that he was not winning, dislocated Jacob's hip and asked to be released. Jacob refused to let go until he got blessed. Then instead of blessing Jacob outright, the man changed Jacob's name to Israel. Instead, because he fought with God and with man, 
and have won. This is significant because God was about to change his identity as a man who was striving through deception into a man who would exercise his faith as a new way of life. When the angel asked Jacob for his name, he wasn't asking Jacob to tell him something he already knew, which is Jacob's identity. But he was giving him an opportunity to confess his character and nature. That Jacob himself was a heel grabber, a deceiver, and a usurper. Before God could bless Jacob, he had to first acknowledge who he was. Jacob was now called Israel, which means God fights. God first had to fight with Jacob, but now God would fight for Jacob. Jacob fought his whole life for God's blessings, as if by hook or by crook. But now, by a brook at Jabuk, he realizes that pride and self-sufficiency could only get him so far. It's incredible for the angel to say that Jacob won his fight with God and men. Jacob has now prevailed with Esau, Laban, and now with the angel. After getting blessed, Jacob named the place Peniel, for he saw God face to face and his life was spared. Let me just say that again. Jacob said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. This is Jacob declaring that God has indeed answered his prayer in chapter 32, verse 11, when he asked God to rescue him from Esau. If he could meet God this way and prevail, potentially meeting Esau had nothing on him. It's like taking Battlestar Galactica in USS and then taking the mummy returns would be nothing after that. After this incident with God, doesn't it give Jacob the confidence to face Esau? But this came with a price. From here on out, Jacob walked with a limp. The word used to describe the result of the angel's finishing move on Jacob is significant. It means separation, alienation, dislocation. Physically, that certainly happened to Jacob's hip. But don't miss out on what happened metaphorically as well. The angel said, Your name will no longer be called Jacob. From now on, you will be called Israel. This was an emphatic Hebrew expression that there would be a separation, an alienation, and a dislocation of Jacob's original identity as a heel grabber, deceiver, and usurper to now Israel, where God fights for him. And he doesn't need to fight for himself anymore. Jacob now had a new name, and he walked with a new limp. His new name would forever remind him of his new destiny. His new limp would forever remind him that in Elohim, Jacob met for the first time someone who overpowered him. The significance of Jacob limping was that he could no longer rely on his natural strength, but now on God. Self-sufficiency is trying to achieve the blessing by our own strength or by the ways of the world. If we keep doing that, God may have to cripple our self-sufficiency to make us trust Him more. If we believe that God is faithful to protect and bless us, then our response should be to rely on Him alone instead of on ourselves or others or in circumstances. You know, just on Monday, something traumatizing happened to my kids. This was after we returned home from skate scooting at Labrador Park on our usual Monday afternoon outing together. You know, there were many things to bring back home, so I asked my helper to come down to the pickup point to bring the kids up first while I brought the rest of the barang barang up after I parked the car. I found out about what happened when I returned home. You know, Eden was better at the scooter, so she went on ahead and she pressed the lift button. My son and helper trailed behind Eden. In that split second where Eden pressed the lift button, the lift door opened and Judah happily scooted into that lift on his own. And before my helper could catch up with Judah, the lift door closed. In her desperation, she tried to yank the door open, but it was too late. So right before her very eyes, she saw the lift ascend. Judah was inside the lift. 
alone. There are 47 floors in my block. Four lifts service these 47 floors. My daughter was shell-shocked because she was the one who activated the door to open. Right at that point in time, my helper burst into tears. Eden, looking at my helper, burst into tears as well. Two helpless crying girls. One helpless boy. It was a really desperate situation. Well, thank God there were three men in that lift lobby together with my helper and my daughter. And my helper couldn't take the stairs. You know, she wanted to run up 47 floors. She couldn't do that to leave my daughter behind because my daughter was alone. So the men took control of the situation. They told her to take the lift to 47th floor in another lift while they waited for the other lifts to either come down or go up, right? So Eden and my daughter went up to the 47th floor and then realized when they got there that the lift that Judah was in went to the 37th floor, then to the 25th floor, then to the 14th floor, and it was on the way down. Anything could have happened at this point in time. So in desperation, they returned to the ground floor. When they arrived, they saw another man carrying Judah in one hand and his skate scooter in another hand. I believe the original man that were at the lift lobby told him to wait for my helper and my daughter to return. As soon as Judah saw my helper and his sister, he burst into tears. Apparently, the man told my helper that Judah wasn't crying when he found him on the 37th floor. But through the tears, this man was convinced that Judah belonged to the same household as a crying helper and a crying little girl. Three of them returned home in tears. God had protected my son. You know, when we saw all of them, my wife and I weren't angry because something like this could have happened even under our care as well. My helper was extremely apologetic. This was her first big mistake in her one year with us. My daughter felt extremely guilty. She thought it was her fault because she pressed the lift button. All three of them were so traumatized. Neither plan A or plan B worked. And plan C was a kind man who brought Judah to the ground floor. In tears, my helper and daughter had to face their greatest fears of potentially seeing some harm happen to my son. You know, my wife and I had to do PTSD counseling with all of them. You can imagine my daughter and my son on my lap, hugging me and just receiving comfort from me. And you can also be very sure that in their hearts and mind, their method of entering the lift and taking the lift in the future is forever rewritten. You know, today, if we say that God is faithful to protect us and bless us as we rely on Him alone, then what does it really mean to rely on God alone? To rely on God alone, it means to seek God first as plan A. And that means to surrender all your plans to God, not just the last few plans, but all your plans from the beginning. My friends, don't make God your last resort. In everything that Jesus did, He always sought God first. So today, if we say that we rely on God alone, then let us seek God as our plan A. And if we say that we want to rely on God alone, let us face up to our greatest fears. Don't run away from our fears. Attack it. Don't let your fears conquer you anymore. Remember that in Christ, you are more than an overcomer. In Christ, He has given you the victory over your fears. And today, if we say that we want to rely on God alone in our desperation, then let us have God rename our destiny. My friends, I want to tell you that wrestling with God isn't a bad thing. Because at the end of the wrestling match, you will realize that God is not fighting against you, but God is fighting for you. So let us today remember that God is waiting to bless us. God is waiting to protect us if only we will rely on Him alone in our desperation. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much, O oh God, that You are a God who is waiting to protect us. You are a God who is eager to bless us. And Father, You are just waiting for us 
to rely on you alone. And Father, sometimes we only start to rely on you alone when we are desperate. So Father, we pray right now, O God, that whenever we are desperate, we will learn to rely on You. We will learn, O God, to go to You, to allow You to have our future, our destiny rewritten. Father, that today, Lord, we will go to You when we are desperate to face our greatest fears and to know that, God, You are fighting with us, fighting for us, against our greatest fears. And Father, we also want to pray, O oh God, that today you will challenge us to always put you first and to seek you first as our plan A and not as our final resort. And Father, as we do that, Lord, we will see your protection and your blessing in our lives. So Father, whatever that the young people are going through, whatever that the young adults are going through, Father, I pray, O oh God, that they will seek you first they will face their greatest fears with you. And Father, they will allow you to rewrite their future destinies. I commit them into your hands, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this week. I'll see you next week. Thank you, Pastor Joey, for sharing the word with us. And I hope all of us manage to take away some learning point that we can apply to our daily lives. We have two more updates to share before we go. Firstly, we are soon approaching July. Next weekend, we will be having Holy Communion. So don't forget to prepare your own Holy Communion emblems before you join us for service next week. Next will be on our ABM. Although Elections Polling Day is on the 10th of July, please note there is no change to our ABM, which will proceed as 10th or 10th of July at 8pm. So here's a final reminder to all voting members of Grace Assembly. Please submit your completed and signed proxy forms as soon as you can. You can submit via email to abmproxy at graceaog.org or by post. All proxy forms must reach the church office via email or post by 3rd of July 2359. For security reasons, all voting members will have received an email to pre-register if you wish to attend the EABM on 10th of July. You need to pre-register by Monday, the 29th of June at 2359. Also, for voting members without email or mobile phone, you have received a hard copy letter on how you can also participate in the EABM. For more information about the EABM, as well as answers to the questions that have been raised, please visit our website at www.gradeaog.org Thank you for tuning in this weekend and we wish you a blessed day ahead. told us that uh, maybe things are a little bit um, different. Now you see, uh, my father remarried when I was uh, 13 years old. When I was 15 years old, he started his family. So I remember in that time, uh, when he was about to get married, everybody was everybody around me, all my relatives, my aunties, uncles, they were shielding my sister and I and making sure that we didn't find out anything about uh, the wedding. So you would imagine that uh, uh, when he did that uncle thing at Chinese New Year, it really just uh, broke our hearts. Um, so when I found Jesus, I remember uh, reading the verse, uh, John chapter 1 verse 12, it says, But to all who received, oh sorry, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. You know, he told me that I simply had to believe Jesus, I simply had to accept Jesus, and then Jesus will give me the right to become God's child. And that meant everything to me because uh, the peak of my uh, daddy issues, I, I guess, it peaked at 16 years old. I was, a, I was a very, very angry boy. I had lots of baggage. I was insecure. I was incomplete. Uh, and I felt like I was very inadequate. Um, I think uh, Pastor Becky would know me as a 16-year-old boy. And um, I was very attention-seeking and I was in and out of relationships. 
So if you ask me what a father was like uh, and how that translates to my relationship with the Heavenly Father, it was very, very difficult to reconcile that the Heavenly Father is good and perfect and it's so different from my earthly father. So I had to really unpack and undo quite a, a fair bit of what I had experienced with my own father in order for me to understand who the Heavenly Father is. So my story is very, very different from uh, Becky's and John's story and I think maybe some of us here have a story that's similar to mine where your earthly father is quite different from the heavenly father that you read about in the Bible. Yeah. Like my dad is someone who's very involved, someone who loves God a lot and really take care, takes care of my mom. Uh, he, when he passed on my mom, my mom took at least two years before she started to like really step out of the house uh, because she, he did everything for her. He would buy stuff for her, he would tap off food, do everything, run errands and all that for her. So he really took care of her and he took care of us. And uh, I think if I have one word that I can sum my dad up, he's like this solid, uh, I wouldn't say solid rock, but maybe solid stone, uh, you know, like solid rock is Jesus, he's a solid stone um, that mimics after the rock and he's like a protector. He, uh, I remember growing up when I was young, uh, I was bullied in, in, um, in kindergarten, in preschool. Uh, and I remember coming home crying and crying and crying because this big guy was just beating me up. Uh, and my dad, literally next day when he found out I was crying, he went to the school, he went to this big guy and he said that stop bullying my son.